Hi, Church of Hope. Before I get started here, I know that uh, to preface everything, I want to preface something that we talk about Proverbs and we talk about wisdom, but I want to preface everything we do here with... Are we, are we okay? Are we on? Okay. I want to preface everything that we do here by looking at where we are at in believers in 2017. Rather than going to Proverbs just to begin with and just sort of jumping in there, I want to remind us of our position in Christ. And you can just listen to this as I read in Colossians chapter 2. Paul the Apostle said, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you. He said to the Colossians, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. He wanted them to know that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul says, he talks about them, he wants them to know all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom, that is, the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now I say this, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And here is when we contrast wisdom with that which is not wisdom for our New Testament ears. Just a reminder here before we go back into the Old Testament. Paul says to the Colossians, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him, or in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you, the believer, are complete in him, complete in Christ, who is the head of all principality and power. One last paragraph. In him, in Christ, you also were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, we the believers, being dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, in other words, in times past, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. In Christ and in the Father are all the riches of wisdom and knowledge. And when we look at what we have in Christ, the scripture says we are complete in him. So as we go to the book of Proverbs and wisdom, remember in whom wisdom is and who it is from and in Christ, our great head, we are the body with all the parts that serve one another. In Christ, we are complete and we can have by our listening, little by little by little, a complete or a more complete knowledge of him as we remain on the earth and honor and obey him in our life. So with that, little story to tell you at the beginning here. When my mom and dad got married in Minnesota back in the 1950s, they went on their honeymoon. But their honeymoon was different than most others. They did not plan where they were, in, with, where they were going to go by car. They just got in the car with their suitcases and took off. 
and they decided if they wanted to go north, they would go north. If they agreed on going west or east or whatever, they just went wherever. They took a left, a right, went down farm roads and went down two-lane highways. They didn't have any freeways back then, if you would think about. Maybe California they did. And there was the place that they ended up in was North Dakota. And they were just having fun, and they were not making any plan whatsoever. And this is how life seems to work sometimes. We start out going someplace just to go. We start out going someplace just to enjoy. And we end up in a place that either we did not expect or perhaps we had hoped for all along. But life is life and there are many roads to take. Many people we come in contact with. And we certainly don't know as we travel in life where we're going to end up ultimately. We're not talking about eternity at this point. We're just talking about paths of life. Some of us like to make plans, right? Some of us don't. Some are organizers and some are free to choose uh, as they go kind of thing. So for those who make plans, plans don't always turn out as they hoped. And for those who don't make plans, the things that turn out are sometimes better than they had hoped for. So in the meantime, life goes on with or without our plans. And even though the planners try their best to minimize the un unexpected, non-planners seem to welcome the unexpected. But there is also the in-between crowd. They are the half-planners and the half-free spirits who somehow want to have this balance in the middle. But where do we have this thing called balance? Where does this thing balance come from? Does this balance come from experience? Does it come from years and years of bad or unpleasant experiences that finally make you realize what a good decision is in a particular area? Or what if you don't have the experience in a certain, a certain area of everyday life? Are we expected to make a thousand wrong decisions before we realize which is the right one? If that were the case, wouldn't one pay to listen to someone who has been there, done that? Pay someone who has traveled down a certain road so we would know what to do, what not to do, and when to do it? There's a story about a banker. And the old 75-year-old banker was about ready to pass on the bank to his son-in-law. And the son-in-law was around 45 years old, and he was tagging along with that banker for about a whole year and a half as he was preparing to pass it on to the younger man, his son-in-law. Anyways, after about two or three months as he tagged along, the young son-in-law says, he says to his father-in-law, he says, you, you make such good decisions. There's a lot of things that happen in the bank here, but your things are always going so well. How, how, do, you, how do you do it? And the old man said, good decisions, my boy, good decisions. Well, about six or eight months later, the son-in-law saw how everything was going, and it was looking really good. And sure, things happened at the bank that didn't work out always so good for as far as uh, on the surface, but the old man usually ended up taking care of it, and the bank grew. So finally, the young man says again, he says, how do you do this? You always end up with such good progress, a good bottom line. And the old man says, good decisions, my boy, good decisions. Well, then finally, when he's about ready to take the reins, about ready to take over the bank, the old man was passing along a few extra things and information to him and he says, he says, now my dear son-in-law, do you have any questions for me before I pass the bank over to you? And the son-in-law, he says, I do have a question for you. He says, you're always making these good decisions, good decisions, good decisions. How is it that you end up making all these good decisions? And the old man looked at the man, the young man, and he says, Bad decisions, my boy, bad decisions. And sometimes life is like that. We sometimes think that we have to make bad decisions in order to make good decisions. But when we look at it, when we look at what we're going to get into just in the perspective prior to me looking at some things with Proverbs, aren't those people who would and could give us advice if they would, aren't they the parents? The moms and the dads, aren't they the grandpas and the grandfathers and the wise old relatives, if there is any around in your circles? Aren't they the ones who are the unpaid professionals that should actually give us from youth up this 
this, this training, this training in some sort of, uh, uh, don't put your finger in the electrical socket or don't put your finger on the stove and brush your teeth and floss and uh, say please and thank you kind of thing. But that means if these people teach by word or by deed, that we would be open to listening to them. Open to doing the things that they suggest would help us in our life. And if we are not open to listening, uh, have these tellers of truth, so to speak, or at least they're attempting to tell truth, if we do not listen as a youngster or whatever, have they wasted their time? Have they failed to carry out their responsibility? If we are not open to listening to our elders as we grow up from baby to child to teen to adult, aren't we just setting ourselves up for future failure in life? In relationships with people, in relationships with God? Just as an aside, not all people who tell us the truth are truth tellers. For not all seeming truth is truth. Or even a child will pick up a rock and say, look, mommy, I found gold. And you see a black rock, and a lot of you have seen it. You see little specks of gold in there, and a little kid will pick it up and say, look, mommy, I found gold. And the mommy will look at the little kid and say, if they're honest, they will say, oh, that's just fool's gold. That's not gold. And sometimes the little flecks that are in that gold are like what people pass off as truth. It's just a certain amount of untruth or fake truth. But keep that in mind, this aside, this gold or fool's gold idea, for we are going to go into a portion of scripture just after my introduction to hear about gold and silver and precious stones. And we are going to find out that even though they are precious to the eye, rubies and sapphires and gold of Ophir and things like that we're going to find out. There's something far more precious that, that does not, that does not, that does not seem to be precious at first glance. So stay tuned to that. Now back to what I was saying about learning about relationships with man and God. In speaking about relationships with people whom we do see, we also have a relationship with God whom we do not see. Is there any way to get this kind of wisdom that I have just spoken about if we had not had parents or grandparents to teach us these things? Or if we did have these parents and grandparents to teach us these things when we were younger, a certain amount of wisdom or skill for living, did we actually listen? Or if we listen poorly, are we still stuck in that sort of lack of wisdom stage? And if there were any way to get this kind of wisdom now, all these years later, or if we, as I'm thinking about the young people in the audience here, is there any way that in addition to what mom and dad are saying, is there any way to take something that we're going to say today and add that to what mom and dad has said to give you sort of a super boost, so to speak, in your wisdom procurement, should I say? If that were the case, where would we go to get it? Where would we go to get this kind of wisdom now? In a certain place, is there a certain place where we could find it, this wisdom? Is there a way to search out true wisdom without having to wade through and pay for every self-help self book out there? And even if we could find this truth, these precepts for skillful living, what guarantees us that this truth is the truth that would truly help us? Is there any place that will tell us plainly just what to do, what not to do, in order to be blessed in our overall relationships with people and wives and kids and bosses, etc. Is there a single skill for living book out there that we could go to in order to grab this? Nicodemus, remember in John chapter 3, he says, I, uh, when Jesus says, you must be born again, and Nicodemus says, uh, a person can't go back into his mother's womb and and, uh, you know, be born again, can he? And he didn't get the point that it was a second birth kind of thing that had nothing to do with physical birth. So can we go climb up on our mother's lap? My mother is 92 years old. Can I crawl back on my mother's lap again and say, Mommy, tell me the things that you never told me before? Oh, I did tell you those things, but maybe she could tell me again. Or can we crawl up on our dad's lap and say, Hey, Dad, those things that I didn't listen to when I was a teenager, could you tell me one more time? I don't think that's going to work. Either they're too old or these parents sometimes have taken a route in their life such that they didn't apply the very things that we had been told by them when we were younger and we end up being in a position where we probably wouldn't listen to them quite as respectfully because we've seen that they've not taken their own words to heart. So 
where can we go? But before we go into this place, this book, this thing that we would call wisdom, the skill for living, we need to ask ourselves, what is the difference between human wisdom, like a stitch in time saves nine, like if you got a rip in your shirt or something and you know, your, your wife or your mother or your whoever could stitch one stitch and take care of it, but if you let it go for a long time, you're going to have to end up doing nine stitches, so to speak. These things that are stitch in time that saves nine, or I was working with my son the other day and we were measuring something out. And I said, well, you know what the old, you know what the old saying is, measure twice, cut once. So we measured it basically twice and made sure that when we cut, it was cut surely and whatever. But this difference between the kind of human wisdom and the human sayings or the human proverbs, so to speak, penny saved is a penny earned, etc. an apple a day keeps a doctor away. What's the difference between that and such something as trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding? In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path smooth. Or it might say in a proverb, in the book of Proverbs, it'll say, a harsh word stirs up anger but a soft word turns away wrath. How are those things different in the book of Proverbs, for example, than what we hear in day to day? Just keep that in mind. Ultimately, in my message today, I'm going to say some things about the book of Proverbs. There's over 900 Proverbs or 900 verses that relate to that book. Surely I have not done anything but scratch the surface of the book of Proverbs. And all I'm trying to do here today is to take and give you a little bit of a, a flavor of the book of Proverbs. But to give you that flavor so that whether you come to the class over here or not in the second hour, at least if your schedule allows it, that's one thing, but even if it does not, at least perhaps, Lord willing, I've wet your taste a little bit for what <coughs> is in Proverbs so you yourself can with open ears and open heart, pursue some of the things that can be an actual lifetime of pursuit that can really give you some great insights into not only God, but also relationships with God and man. I just want you to, I just want you to listen. You don't have to turn there. And if we, were to, if we were to take something like a quick view of Scripture where you have Adam and Eve in the garden and you have Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Joseph leaves, ends up in Egypt. He becomes second in charge over all Egypt. And God allows him to be the one who allows the 70 people who are the Israelites, Jacob and his 12 sons to be able to come over there to now start to prosper in such a way that those 400 years that pass now make this nation that was 70 people now probably bustling over 2 million. We now come into where Moses takes the people across the Red Sea and we have him giving the people not only the Ten Commandments, but also the other 603 commandments besides the Ten Commandments for a total of 613 that was considered the Mosaic Law. And this right here, we move from the Mosaic Law. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the veil was rent in two. And instead of a priest going into the actual temple to sacrifice once a year, we now are priests in and of ourselves. And we have the right to have a relationship with God, not face to face, but at least in the idea of that we are the ones who can go personally to God. But we have what some people think Job was, perhaps one who was a contemporary with some of the earlier patriarchs. Adam and Eve would have, you know, had, and you got Methuselah who was like 900 years old. But some people think that Job was one who was prior and wrote and had his difficult time, the, the trials of Job, so to speak, prior to anything to do with the Mosaic Law. So if you think about Job right here, and I asked the question earlier, where can wisdom be found and where is the place of wisdom? Listen to just some simple things that have to do with minds 
and silver mines and gold mines and the fact that people go down into the earth and they create shafts in the earth and they are the ones that when I went into a mine up in northern Minnesota one time we went about three-fourths of a mile down into the ground and there was actual where they hooked up into the ceiling where there was ropes that hang down and there was a chair almost like I if you took these legs off this chair that I'm sitting on and you just had a chair that had ropes attached to it and they would swing from these ropes and they would chop and ship and they would do all this stuff and they would hang down below the ground and we saw those swing chairs that were down there where they could hook them up to the ceiling and they could chop away and there were people down who were far away from any man and the animals that were up here they would never see it but just listen to Job in light of what I said in my introduction where can wisdom be found there is a place for everything else but let's see how that shakes out in Job 28. Just listen to this. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Man puts an end to darkness and searches every recess for ore in the darkness and the shadow of death. Man breaks open a shaft away from people in places forgotten by feet. They hang far away from men. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, from it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are the source of sapphires, and it contains gold dust. That path underneath the earth where they mine. That path no bird knows, nor has the falcon's eyes seen it. The proud lions have not trodden it, nor has the fierce lion passed over it. He, referring to man, puts his hand on the flint or on the rock. He overturns the mountains by its roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks, and his eye sees every precious thing. He dams up the streams from trickling, what is hidden he brings forth to light. But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me. And the sea says, it is not with me. Wisdom cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed for its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir and the precious onks or sapphire, nor gold nor crystal can equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewelry of fine gold. No mention should be made of coral or quartz, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Destruction and death say, we have heard a report about it with our ears. God understands its way. And God knows wisdom's place, for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heavens to establish a weight for the wind and apportion the waters by measure. God saw it when he made a law for the rain, and God saw it when he made a path for the thunderbolt. Then God saw wisdom and declared it. He prepared it. Indeed, he searched it out. And to man, God said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. The 
fear the Lord, that is wisdom. To depart from evil, that is understanding. The sheets that I handed out, does everybody have a sheet? I think if, if you don't, my wife has some here to pass out and Alex has other ones there. But today what we're going to go over is something very just, I'm just going to look at the blue highlights right here. Just look on your sheet at the blue highlights. Where can wisdom be found? And We just dealt with that in Job 28. Number two, why was Solomon wise and how did he get wiser? Number three, how did Solomon show forth his wisdom to others? And what is this wisdom that Solomon is talking about? And then a postscript. To start out with, with Job 28, when Job goes and says there is a place for everything, there is a mine for silver and a place for gold, but where is the place where wisdom is found? Job said there is a place, and God knows the place. And God declared it just like he declared a path to the thunderbolt and he declared how the rain was going to come down. God declared to man and he said, the fear of the Lord or the respect of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Job was pre-law. Job was pre-Old Testament Solomon. Under Solomon, Solomon was under the Mosaic law. <coughs> Solomon was the king who had the Mosaic law, the 613 commands, the Ten Commands were the original Ten Commandments. The other 603 related to the high priests and what they should do on certain days. And they related to everything that had to do with feasts that, that the young men were supposed to go to three times a year. And the law was there as basically the constitution of the nation of Israel. And Solomon followed two previous kings. King Saul was the first king. And he was the king that reigned for 40 years. And he was the one that started out as one who was doing well as unto the Lord. But then there was about three incidences that in succession made it such that the kingdom was plucked from him. Even though it was plucked early from him, as the scripture would seem to indicate, he still stayed in that position for the next 40 years. And then Saul, when he was going down in his decrease, David was being chased by that very Saul and David, through his different circumstances, was being one who was being prepared for the kingdom. But this young man, David, was being prepared for the kingdom such that he started out as a shepherd, as a shepherd boy. And even in one of the Psalms that says that God took him from the sheepfolds to shepherd my people Israel, God says. And it was that man, David, who was, quote unquote, a man after God's own heart, who had Solomon as his son. But remember, before we get too inconsiderate of how God works with ordinary people like us, but David himself, there came a point when he did not go out to war, but he was the one that ended up staying home one year. And that's when he looked upon this woman who was, you know, in a state of undress, uh, ways away from him, it was Bathsheba, he invited Bathsheba over to the kingdom, to the palace or whatever. He had relations with her. From there, he was concerned because she got pregnant. David was the one that went ahead and had orders given so that Joab, I believe it was Joab, would have Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, killed. Then David married Bathsheba. The first son died from that original relationship. Later on, the second born son would have been Solomon. And Solomon was the one who was the same Solomon who has all these proverbs here, the wisdom of Solomon. And in the middle of all that, we have to remember that Solomon, he was the son of David, yes, but he was one who David himself, the man after God's own heart, would have trained. In a Deuteronomy 6 chapter, in Deuteronomy 6, if you could just turn there for a moment, we have just to give a little pre-hint of what is going on here. If you don't have a Bible or it on your phone, um, just go ahead and just listen. But Deuteronomy 6 was one of those commandments of those 613 that related to Solomon. And some of these things I feel are important for as far as pulling together for the book of Proverbs, 
because it sort of hints at how we can look at those things as parents or grandparents and those who would give you know, um, uh, people wisdom. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, one of the commandments of the 613, it says, now this is the commandment. And these are the statutes and judgments. In Deuteronomy, Moses was speaking to, Moses was speaking to the generation that was about to go into the land to conquer the land under Joshua and Caleb. This was not the original message that was given to the people that rejected the initial plan to go in. Those are the 600,000 marching men whose carcasses died in the wilderness because they did not have the belief that God could have them handle all the giants in the land. So Moses is making this plea, these commands to those people as they're about to go into the land. This is the commandment and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God. Oh, there is that fear the Lord your God. God again. It was a part of the structure of these people's whole thinking. Even David said in one of the Psalms, he says, let me teach you the fear of the Lord. Other places it says that we can learn the fear of the Lord. He says that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, God speaking now, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may, be multiply, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. And then here comes the next part. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And verse 6 is my key verse here. And these words, God told these parents who would teach their children, and those children would grow up and ultimately teach their children's children, etc. And these words, and I'm talking specifically of the Mosaic law that they had the precepts and the commandments that were related to Israel. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. You shall talk of them when you walk by the way. You shall talk of them is the idea when you lie down and when you rise up. And the idea is that when this father who would get to know the Mosaic Law and a lot of the things they did back in those days, they for the most part would have been illiterate people. They would be able to just listen to the Word of God. And they would listen and they would memorize and they would have a whole path for those young people that they are the ones that the fathers would pour into, the mothers would pour into, and this Deuteronomy 6 idea was that when they rose up in the morning, ah, oh, good morning, Daddy, and maybe something would say, oh, look at that beautiful sunrise that God made. God has made his wonderful works to be remembered. Just think when we were, last year when we were at that sunset and all those things we were trusting God for, and all the things when they rise up and sit by the way and all those kinds of things. Now turn over to Proverbs chapter 4 as a little bit of a background, continuing with David. So basically go to the middle of your Bible, if you've got a Bible, and hang a right, and you're right there at uh, Proverbs, the next one. So Proverbs chapter 4, Solomon is talking to his sons. And in the context of Solomon, I would suggest that Solomon, since he was a king, he was in the midst of royalty, he would have lived in the midst of royalty with his father, David, and Solomon himself would have been wanting to not only teach the Mosaic Law in Deuteronomy 6 sense to his children, but also wanting to teach it to his children maybe with a little bit more emphasis that they themselves who are in the midst of royalty would one day perhaps take a part of Solomon's kingdom and be able to hold that part of the kingdom or that administrative duty. So Solomon had sort of a double thing going there, Deuteronomy 6 kind of thing, and Solomon wanted to prepare them for a royalty that they could be true, responsible um, members of the royal household, so to speak. So here Solomon is talking to his own children, it seems in the context, hear my children the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine, do not forsake my law. And then here Solomon reflects on the time when he was David's son. So think of him, Solomon, talking, let's say if you're Solomon's children out there, and I'm now talking to you and saying, hear my children the instruction of a father and give attention to no understanding for I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. And then now when I'm speaking to you, my royal son, so to speak, 
then he says, says, do not forsake my law. And then he says, when I was my father's son, when I, Solomon, was my father's son, David's son, when I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words. Keep my commands and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will preserve you and on and on. But the idea is when I was my father, David's son is the idea, he taught me and said to me, the next parts of those verses, get wisdom, get understanding. And later on he says, get wisdom. He says, do not forsake her and she will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. And then continue on with what he said to David, what David said to Solomon, therefore get wisdom and in all you're getting get understanding. Exalt her and she will promote you, David told Solomon. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. So we have a Solomon who lived under the Mosaic law, who would have been trained, and we even see the words that he expresses about his own father, that he would have been trained not only in a Deuteronomy 6 sense with the Mosaic law, but to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and the second greatest command, love the Lord, love your, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as you love, love yourself. So with those kinds of things that Solomon was now having, was being built into by his father David, Solomon now, if you turn to 1 Kings chapter 3, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings chapter 3. I cannot remember where it is right now. I tried looking it up, but I just could not get the right words. But there is something that I did some research on one time where just before Solomon became king, David brought his son Solomon with, in front of all the elders and all the people who were of importance. And he said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced. And paraphrasing, he will need you the administrators and things like that to help him because he is young and inexperienced. But then he said about his son, he said to Solomon at one point, he says, you are wise. And he was passing the baton over to his son Solomon. But I remember it saying in scripture something to the effect where he said to Solomon, you are wise. So I think that comes from the Proverbs chapter 4 idea, the Deuteronomy chapter 6 idea, and here he is at a point where his father, just the fact that he put him in the kingdom as the king, that he figured that he was the son to do it, he was wise, one might think. But the backdrop on even that was Solomon was the very son when David wanted to build a temple to the Lord. He wanted to build something because... In the, in, 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 the, in the Old Testament sense, God always was within this temple that was out in the temple or tabernacle that was out in the wilderness. And there you had the Shekinah glory and you had the Ark of the Covenant and it was behind badger skins, which was the walls and everything like that. And in the midst of all that, you had Solomon, David who wanted to build a temple to the Lord. He could not do it because he was scripturally, God told him that he was a man of blood. He had shed so much blood that it would not basically look good if he was the one that took over and built this temple. It was supposed to be reserved for his son Solomon. David got everything prepared. He got the gold and the silver and got everything all set up. He had the plans all ready. So when Solomon became king, he looked at Solomon and says, you are wise. He asked other people to help him because he was young and experienced. So with that idea that he was already wise, as I said here, why was Solomon wise? I just told you, Deuteronomy 6, Proverbs 4. And how did he get wiser? Let's just look at 1 Kings chapter 3. And I think you'll see how this all ties into Proverbs very shortly. It says... Solomon made it, 3 verse 1, Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. People sacrificed, verse 2, at the high place. 
There was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. Verse 2. I'm skipping a little bit. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. Now the king, referring to Solomon, went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. This was after he, he had become king now. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, at this place, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? What would you do if you were asked that question by God? Just a little aside there. And Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in a and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son, referring to himself, to sit on this throne as it is this day. Now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king, in other words, me, Solomon. O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Now listen to this, verse 10. 1 Kings 3.10. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before, so that there has not been anyone like before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have given you what you have not asked. I have given you what you have not asked, God continued, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among all the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and commandments, there's the Old Testament law again, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. From there, Solomon, who was already wise, he was wise enough to ask for, he had general wisdom, and he was very, he was wise enough to ask for very specific wisdom. I don't know what I'm doing in the midst of me taking over from my father David, who had ruled for 40 years. And, and to add to that, Solomon became king in the midst of a very controversial situation. One of David's sons had declared himself king on the other side of the kingdom. And Bathsheba, and Nathan the prophet found out about it and walked into King David and said, what's this about, you never told us that your other son was going to be made king? And then Bathsheba said, remember you told me that uh, my son Solomon was going to become king? And David said, I will keep my promise. He made Solomon king that very day after his own brother had declared himself king on the other side of the kingdom. It was in the midst of that trouble he became king. So you can see why he would have asked for wisdom. And God gave him what he asked for and gave him what he did not ask for. It's this amazing story. So that is how Solomon became wise and how he got wiser. So how did Solomon show forth his wisdom to others? Um, in 1 Kings chapter 3, I'll just say this in the brevity of time. In 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon was one who, after this whole thing was done, if you read the story at the end of Proverbs chapter uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, two prostitutes came before Solomon, and, and they both had a baby. And while they were sleeping with each their own separate babies, one of the mothers rolled on, the other, on, the, on her own kid and killed it. So she reaches over to the other mother in the middle of the night, takes her baby, puts it in her bosom, takes the dead one, puts it in the other mother's bosom, and when they woke up in the morning, uh, the, the mothers know their own kids. They know how what their fingers and toes and face looks like. She says, this is not my kid. They ended up in front of King Solomon. They ended up in front of King Solomon. And Solomon, in the whole process of things, and here is the part now. I'll just read this last part. This last part here. Then the woman whose son was living, 
spoke to the king. It says, and the king says, this one says, this is my son who lives. And this is the dead one. The other one says, no, but your son is dead. And Solomon was trying to sort this all out. Then the king Solomon said, and think about this in terms of Proverbs. Solomon asked for wisdom. And right here on the heels of asking for that, this big test came to him. And right away, he had a chance to prove out that this wisdom was not only from God, but this spread like wildfire around the kingdom, that he was a man of wisdom. Then the king says, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two, give half to the one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son. And she said, oh, my Lord, give her the living child and, and, and by no means kill him. But the other said, let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him or divide the child. So the king answered and said, give the first woman the living child and by no means kill the child. She is his, <coughs> she is his mother. Only a mother would speak with that kind of compassion toward her own son. And only the unmother would speak with uncompassion to say, kill it and divide it. And all Israel heard of the judgment which a king had rendered, and they feared the king. For they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. So we have the prostitute story, 1 Kings chapter 3. The Queen of Sheba story, 1 Kings 10. You can go there and look. But the Queen of Sheba came from afar because she heard about King Solomon's wisdom. She got there and she listened to Solomon and all the things that he was saying. And she says, the half of it has not been told me. I now hear and now I believe that God has given you this wisdom. And she marveled at the wisdom that she had heard about and now was blown away by this wisdom. And then the, all the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, quote-unquote. That comes from 1 Kings 10. All these people from all over came to hear wisdom from Solomon. And one comment here, just as an aside, the fragility of wisdom or how fragile it is. In 1 Kings chapter 10, we have the height of wisdom being talked about and the Queen of Sheba coming and all these things and not the half of it's been told. And then all of a sudden, boom, in chapter 11. Solomon marries many foreign women and all these women who worshipped other gods took Solomon's heart from the Lord, the living God, Jehovah, and brought his heart toward worshipping other gods. They tore his heart away from the living God because this man of wisdom can flip just like a switch. And he can do stupid things. So if anything you think about Proverbs, do not think of Proverbs as something that is the Solomon side of him where he is the failure. But think of him as the Solomon who is the king who in his humility and in his great need for God to intervene as he took the kingdom in this very vulnerable time. Think of Solomon as the one who got wisdom from God because he asked for the very thing that related to God's glory. Think of Solomon and these Proverbs as Proverbs that relate to Solomon when he was in his glory, applying wisdom day to day and teaching his own sons. Because if we go the other place, we're going to not respect what God has allowed in his scripture for as far as the Proverbs. How much time do I have left? Uh, five minutes. Proverbs chapter 1. Listen to Proverbs chapter 1. Just everybody put your Bibles down and just listen to Proverbs chapter 1. This is what Solomon says as his invitation to the book of Proverbs. Imagine you're all royal sons and daughters of the king and you are listening to me, Solomon. 
the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, who let us lie and wait to shed blood, who let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause, who let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. <laughs> but they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. And so you know that I am being Lady Wisdom I am going to wear this at the different times that I might do Proverbs. Wisdom is personified in chapter 1 and various other chapters through chapters 1 through 9. 1 through 9 sets the whole stage for the book of Proverbs. And what you gain in 1 through 9 is like the foundation. 10 through 31 is like the house that's built upon it. In your attitude toward the Lord God and Proverbs and wisdom and having an attitude like Solomon give me wisdom is going to impact how those wisdom blessings come back to you. So the continuing on with chapter one, wisdom personified. Wisdom is if it's speaking to you, but Solomon is speaking, but this is wisdom personified. Then Solomon says, wisdom calls, I'll put this on at the moment, I start talking. Solomon's still talking now. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the openings of the gates in the city, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight themselves in scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you. <laughs> Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel and despise my ever rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple or the naive 
or the gullible, for the turning of away, for the turning away of the simple will slay them. And the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me, wisdom, will dwell safely and be secure without fear of evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just praise you for your great faithfulness, your great faithfulness to prepare people like King David, who were taught by his father Jesse, and King David who taught Solomon, and Solomon who teaches us in the book of Proverbs and uses Lady Wisdom to cry out to us and say, turn at my rebuke, surely I will pour out my spirit on you, I will make my words known to you. And we as believers who have a relationship with the living Christ in whom is all wisdom and knowledge and all the completeness that we have in Christ, we pray that those who would be looking into Proverbs and hearing about this great wisdom that Solomon has from you, that we would take to heart these things, take to heart what Lady Wisdom says, take to heart the fear of the Lord, take to heart that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. Help us to completely turn our hearts over to not only the Word of God, all the way through from Genesis to Revelation, but perhaps in addition to that, focus a little bit more on the book of Proverbs, which has for us skill for living. And like it says in closing, Heavenly Fathers, we think about these words. Trust says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Solomon said to his sons, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Help us by learning Proverbs be able to have a high esteem with not only you, God, but also with man. To have skill for living so that we might know how to speak. Know when to speak and when not to speak. Know what to say in circumstances that many people would babble on, but help us to know how to deal with everything from social part of our life to marriage to family to work to our thought life and learn from Proverbs and learn from wise Solomon, but yet to learn from you, the great God who gave that wisdom to him. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.